we've let people know that we are not going to deal with the present issues that are going on in their life, which is a big shift for them. Right. Most of them are coming in with you know career issues or marital issues or parenting depression, issues. parenting. You know, just yeah. and um, what I say to them is that uh, the key to shifting those is in the past. And what I mean by that is that we all start out uh, as kids with a certain program that comes to us because of our childhood experience. Kids are like sponges, and they kind of take, take on whatever the parents are mirroring them, whatever right. experience forms them. And very young, mm -hmm. they get this program. Yep. And that program is really hard to change. It's kind of cemented in. You know, the, the other issue that often comes up with people is uh, about what is trauma. You know, what do you consider a traumatic childhood? And mm -hmm. I have a much broader definition. And again, based on, on the research that I've been looking at uh, about what trauma is. Yeah. And, you know, often in the beginning, it was just, you know, you have an alcoholic parent, you were sexually abused, you were beaten. Those are really yeah. clear traumas. Really blatant. Really blatant, yes. Yeah. Um, now we're starting to see that one of the biggest traumas is neglect. And for many of my clients, they were like, I never saw my father, so it wasn't a problem. Well, you didn't have a father. That's a yeah. huge deal. And the other thing is, uh, what we're learning is that it's the emotional um, attachment uh, between the parents and the, ch and the child that is most critical in terms of whether a child does well or not. Mm -hmm. And so that's often hidden. You know, you can have a family that looks pretty good on the outside, the kids look nice, they go on vacations, they you know, seem okay, but feelings are just not tolerated. Um, and Or there isn't mm -hmm. enough warmth, or there isn't enough... A physical touch um, yeah. or certain emotions are shamed um, and so that has just opened up uh, to, to me the field of trauma to, to include a lot more people who were excluded before and what I tell people is that I think parents all do the best that they can do given what they went through I mean there's two things can be true at once I can know that my parents didn't get what they needed and they're just passing on to me what they got as kids. sure right but at some point, and this is where, um, to me, this work is just a, a temporary piece of work, we have to be able to say to the child, it's okay for you to be angry and sad about what happened to you and to have your day in court. And yep. then I think when you do that, you move from what I call a head forgiveness to a heart forgiveness. Yes. So I the first goal is for each person to go back and, and relook at what happened to them as kids. Mm. Some people know exactly what happened. Other people have a lot of memory gaps so and true. some yeah. people are are in denial about parts of the story and and so the work of the group initially is everybody does a genogram which is the three generational look at their family yep. and looking at the patterns and uh, we're kind of getting to know the cast of characters that form this inner child and so being able to have someone stand up and tell their story and show their genogram is an amazing experience right. and you learn so much about people and you start to see why they have the beliefs they have, why they have the, um, why they deal with their feelings the way that they do, all mm -hmm. of that. Right. Once we get to the truth and, and sort of understand what the story is um, about each child, then we have to do um, the finishing business with it emotionally. Kids are born screaming for help and something shuts them down. If, if a child is not telling a parent that they're upset, something has happened to make them know that it's not safe to do that. So experiential therapy is really about creating new experiences that change the old ones. And it is, I have a, probably 15 or 20 different kinds of experientials that people do. Um, they can also make up their own. But I'll give you sort of a basic idea of what sure. one would be. Um, you might put a picture of, let's say, your father, especially one when he was young and, and parenting you and you put it in a chair mm. across from you. Mm -hmm. And then beforehand, I have the person write a letter uh, on behalf of their inner child to say to the father how he parented this child and how this person feels about it. Mm. And it is incredibly powerful. Yep. And in fact, people are nervous about it at first, but as they start to do it, they literally can see the parent in the chair. And a lot of feeling comes up and a lot of truth telling happens and it's incredibly healing. Yeah. Because basically what we're doing is we're really having uh, an opportunity to have this child have their day in court. 
to finally have the, speak the truth and right. have their feelings about what happened with that. One of the things I love about group is that you can see somebody else's stuff more clearly than your own. So you have a room full of people really paying attention and they see stuff that they can then reflect back to the person in, in an amazing way. That was the first, okay, the yeah, first sure. uh, goal, mm -hmm. right? which is to basically grieve the loss of a normal childhood and to finish business with mom and dad through experiential therapy. And so the group becomes a very safe laboratory for people to practice new skills. The biggest thing to me is learning how to resolve conflict. People get triggered in the present. So something happens in the present that triggers you to that well of pain. Yeah. And then all of that energy goes on to the person who triggered you. And mm -hmm. so there's what I call a bump. Yep. And then there's the well of pain that it, that it connects you to. And so my husband and I developed this tool oh, it's called the one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uh, a difficult tool. Um, and at first you need a moderator to do it. But over time, it becomes something that you use fairly easily. Um, but it's, I, ha I have never found anything that works better. And it is amazing yeah. to me when I watch people go through it that literally you feel closer to the person mm -hmm. you've and you've resolved the bump. And that yep. is huge. Sure. There's the third goal is even though the experiences are very powerful, and mm -hmm. um, I think people who go on weekend workshops will come back and say, wow, I had an amazing cathartic experience, and it really, is, it really changed me. I have found that over time, it fades. And yeah. it fades, and then people are back to the old belief systems and old ways of behavior, and mm -hmm. it's really discouraging. And so mm -hmm. I realized that I needed to find a tool that would solidify the, the change of, of experience that the experientials brought about. And I found this tool called dialoguing. And that was from, the first person I heard about it from was Lucia Capaccione, mm -hmm. who was an artist working with blocked artists, and she would have them use their non-dominant hand to get unblocked. And then she got into her, her own uh, inner child recovery and found that the non-dominant hand connects to the part of the brain where the inner child experience is stored. Um, one of the things that's most fascinating to me with the brain research is that traumatic events are not stored on the timeline. So therefore, when you go back to one, you have no clue that it happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right. It feels like it's happening now. And so, right. um, so the, just technically what you do is you write back and forth between your right and your left hand. You get a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and let's say I'm right-handed, so this is my adult. I might write a question to my child and then put my pen in the other hand, and then the child responds. And mm -hmm. it is unbelievable what comes up. Yeah. And I think you get feeling and information that it might take years of thera talk therapy to get to, if ever. It's just right. incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what I tell people is, when you dialogue, you're going to be, it's as if you have a foster child come and live with you. And you know their history, mm -hmm. and you're going to be their new parent. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you would talk to them about what happened, and you'd help them to have their feelings and know the truth about it. But you'd also be parenting them every day and being the mother or father they never had, which means right. um, saying that you love them, saying that, uh, mm -hmm. talking to them about their concerns, um, being able to constantly have communication with them in the way that they didn't get growing up. Right. So I have clients who have, you know, hundreds really of notebooks of dialogues because they're yeah. dialoguing all the time and literally the other thing about brain research is dialoguing is reprint reprogramming the brain so sure. so that uh you know neurons that fire together wire together you're basically changing these your brain chemistry with the new information mm. and so that's why it's so important to when you've had an experiential for example then to dialogue with it let's say you had an experiential where you finally went oh my god I wasn't a dumb kid. I was actually smart, but I was told I was dumb all the time, and they were wrong. Yeah. Then I would have them maybe do a 30-day dialogue program where they dialogue every day and reinforce this with their kid. Remember, you're not dumb. Right. Let's talk about it. Let's have some more feelings toward mom and dad. Mm. I want you to tell me all the ways that you felt smart today. I'm going to tell you some ways I saw you being smart today. Mm. A lot amazing. of repetition. A lot of not repetition. Not just kind of poof. Because as you know, good parents, yeah. they have to repeat over and over again. Wow. And yeah. these, these things that got cemented in came through repetition. So it's repetition that replaces them. I had a client once, this was actually with a real child, and mm. she uh, went through a divorce, and she discovered that her little girl, I think she was probably six, really believed she caused the divorce. And so what she did yeah. was for a period of two or three months, every night at bed, 
she would talk to her little girl about it and say, you know what, you didn't cause this. And she would answer questions and be able to have her child have feelings about the divorce, but kept coming back to, you didn't cause it. Wow. And she found that over time, her child took it in. You know, I, wow. I, I want to say one more thing about group, because I, I think most people are would be nervous about group and maybe resistant to group. We think um, about our first family was a group. And having mm. another experience of people, you know, having, if you had a violent father, let's say, having men in a group who are amazing and are gentle and listen to you so and true, are safe sure. is really healing. But I, I think that there's, um, I go very, very slowly in, in when I do these groups. I want yep. people to really take their time, see if I'm safe, see if the other people are safe. Right. And we don't even do experientials usually for six to eight months because it wouldn't be safe. Yep, so absolutely. It's just a very, very slow process and um, rarely do people... Uh, find that it, it's too much for them. In fact, they start to see the value of it and start to really look forward to coming.